them, um, our high school wellness center, mental health clinicians here tonight um, to just share some strategies to help your child manage overwhelm, stress, and, and lack of motivation. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please enter them into the Q&A box and um, Breakthrough's other counselor, Brenda Rachels, will answer uh, or will be facilitating a Q&A at the end. Um, we will do our best to get as to as many questions as possible. We had some submitted in advance as well. Um, and, and just so you're aware, this evening's presentation will be made available on the Conejo USD YouTube channel. Um, and so without further ado, I will turn it over to Jennifer Mundy. Hello, everybody. I'm so excited to be here with some of my favorite people in the world. Um, I have the pleasure of working with Lindsay, uh, Lindsay Yant, who is our Wellness Center Mental Health Clinician at Thousand Oaks High School, and Paige Pensivy, who is our Mental Health Clinician at Newberry Park High School, and Claudia Scott, who is at Caneo Valley High School. We also have Jennifer Julian and Allison Carl, who are at Westlake and Century. They are um, not on our presentation today, but they are with us for sure in spirit. Um, we are very excited to be talking with you today about how you can support your students in finding their motivation as we all navigate this rocky year of returning back to in-person um, learning and the challenges and stressors that go with that. So I hope you will enjoy these fabulous people who I affectionately refer to as the wellness wizards because they're like magical, they make magic happen in our wellness centers. Um, so I hope you'll enjoy what they're sharing with you today and then I'll be back at the end to answer your questions. Okay, thanks. Okay, so our agenda for today includes defining motivation. We're going to talk about the psychological factors contributing to motivation. We're going to go through the motivational stages of change. We're going to discuss the factors that interfere with motivation, as well as talk about strategies for success. So what is motivation? We're going to talk about two types of motivation. First is intrinsic, motiva intrinsic motivation. So this is doing an activity for inherent satisfaction rather than to avoid a consequence. When intrinsically motivated, a person is moved to act for the fun or challenge rather than because of external products, pressures, or rewards. So this is engaging in an action or behavior because it is personally rewarding. An example of this could be your student playing a sport because they enjoy the sport. Um, and extrinsic motivation is completing a task or exhibiting a behavior because of outside causes, such as avoiding punishment or receiving a reward. So engaging in an action or behavior for rewards such as a grade, money, or praise. And an example of this could be playing a sport to get a trophy. Okay, so factors connected to motivation. So we know that motivation is important for our students, but how do we do it? How do we motivate? Luckily, there have been many studies that give us some guidelines. And motivation is tied to three basic needs, competency, belonging, and autonomy. Um, for competency, we want to provide our students with activities that provide a challenge but are still manageable. For younger students, this might be completing a puzzle, and for other students, this may be completing a more advanced task, like getting a driving permit or gaining success in a new skill. Belonging is an area that we have some more control over as parents and caregivers. We can create an environment in our home where our children feel safe um, and feel like they belong, that they matter, and that their presence is important to us. Students may also experience a sense of belonging with their peers by finding a group with similar interests and ideas. And lastly, autonomy, that sense of being able to make our own decisions and have our own ideas. For younger students, this may be choosing what to wear to school or having a say in how their bedroom is decorated. Um, and for older students, this may look like making decisions about which classes they take and which activities they're participating in. Um, so let's take a look at motivation and something that we call the stages of change. This can help us understand where a person is in relation making a change. Some of your questions had to do with 
um, time management and how to support our students with this issue. So looking at the cycle and starting with pre-contemplation, a student may be thinking to themselves, what problem? But as the issue progresses, they will continue on to the contemplation phase where they may begin to wonder, why am I always so stressed about getting things turned in on time? Why didn't I do this earlier? And then they move to the pre preparation phase where they may realize I have a problem, but what can I do about this? Um, from here, they move to the action phase. Um, and this could be, I'm ready to put all of my assignments in my calendar. And then once they have done that, they are in what we call maintenance. Um, but as with everything, we sometimes have backsliding and we start to forget to use our calendars, planners, et cetera, and we start the process again, but we'll likely go in deeper this time. Um, and this is a normal part of change. So here are some things we can keep in mind that might interfere with motivation, um, stress, lack of connection, inconsistent schedule, executive functions like organizational skills, attention issues, and regulating emotions, family dynamics, abrupt changes, anxiety, learning environment. So when we are noticing that there is a lack of motivation in our students, it can be a good idea to consider which, if any of these factors, could be influencing them. And then I'll be talking about stress and anxiety versus stress. So stress is the state of mental or emotional strain um, or tension resulting from adverse or very demanding circumstances. So response to an external causing stress such as like a big exam. So um, after your student is done taking that exam, it should go away once the situation is resolved. Um, it can be a positive or negative. It can inspire you to meet a deadline or lose sleep. Um, tense body, they may experience tense body aches, loss of sleep, and uneasy can, uneasiness can occur. And it's short term. Anxiety. Um, anxiety is a feeling of worry, nervousness, or uneasy, typically about um, an event or something that is uncertain of an outcome. Uh, it's an internal response to a reaction to stress, uh, an intense feeling of dread, and um, it interferes with your daily life. Um, it is consistent, and when the, res when the stressful event is resolved, uh, so it's just, it's, it's more long-term, you know, whereas stress is more short-term. Um, they may experience some of the similar, um, what is it called? <laughs> <laughs> right, so physical symptoms at, like such as stress, you know, tense body ache, uh, headaches, loss of sleep, hot flashes, tingling in the hands, shortness of breath could occur. Um, and then how to help motivate a stressful or anxious student. Open-minded questions, um, reflective listening, summarize reflection of behavior, um, and that they're, you know, they, everybody wants a little cheerleader, right? Everybody needs that extra person there to help motivate them. Uh, and then signs of poor time management. So frequently missing deadlines, poor punctuality, decreased quality of work and consistently feeling rushed or overwhelmed too much multi multitasking and burnout. So it's definitely important to not multitask. Um, cause we get overwhelmed, you know, it's just too much. So taking one thing at a time. And so how to help your student manage their time. Um, with a lot of the students we do to do lists, you know, you go from each class, uh, per class, so you make a list for say language arts and then social studies and make all those assignments according to their due date. Um, you can also make a list for self care. You know, it's important to do stuff for yourself, not just work, right? So schedule that fun. Um, and daily planners and daily schedules. And you can get these, they're free printable. Um, you can look them up on the line, you know, free, look up, download, or look up free printable planners online. And there's so many resources there. Um, and reduce procrastination. Um, set your calendar, you know, or little reminders. Um, prioritize prioritizing tasks according to due dates. So you can do that per class or just by date. Um, setting goals, 
get a good night's sleep. We always forget that sleep is so important. Uh, and then setting boundaries is probably one of the toughest ones because you want to please everybody, whether it's your family or your friends. Um, and it's important for us to say, wait, I need to do this first. Um, and then, you know, I'll call you back, right? Um, and avoiding multitasking, we covered that a little bit. Uh, reduce distractions. So limiting TV um, or saying, you know, I'm going to watch TV after I'm done with this uh, assignment, you know, I'll get it for 15 minutes or um, and then turning your phone off or leaving it in the other room or leaving it upstairs, um, limiting that distraction. Uh, and determine your productive, determine your most productive time. So does your child need a little break after they get home from school before they get started on homework? Or can they go right after, you know, you know them best? Do they need, you know, a snack or do they need, you know, some playtime a little bit or some sports and then do math or do homework after all of their extra activities to get some physical activity in. Um, and then download us. So then there's also an app um, that's, you can download, it's called Rest, Time? Rescue Time. Uh, and that helps to uh, kind of uh, help manage our time. And, you know, there's a lot of phone timers as well that help that that can assist you with too. Okay, so now we'll talk about some kind of going back to feeling that anxiety and stress. If we're unmotivated, we're probably not going to want to implement all of the time management skills that we just kind of talked about. So in order to get your student back down to kind of their baseline, in order for them to be motivated and want to kind of study and want to create those time management skills. These are some great, easy things that you can do as a parent or even teach your student um, that they can do for themselves to kind of self-regulate before that time management kind of process occurs. Um, so we'll start with elementary students. Um, so there's a thing called candle um, and bubble breathing. Um, basically, you have your student picture holding a bubble wand, or you can get a real one, um, whatever's lying around the house. Um, and you have them breathe in, like as if they were going to blow on the bubble wand and blow out as many bubbles as they can count. So usually that's more than we can suck in. So we're wanting to get that kind of self-regulation, that brain to realize it's safe by sucking in slow, blowing out longer, essentially. Um, so it's a fun little game you can play with the kiddos that are younger. Another fun thing to kind of get your students in the creative mindset is setting up just an art night at home. Maybe that's bringing out markers that they haven't been able to use or finger painting, um, whatever your student tends to gravitate towards um, for their creative skills is a great fun plan throughout the week to get them motivated to then want to complete steps later um, down the road. The last thing is a coping skill scavenger hunt. Um, so things that help your student remain calm. So their favorite stuffed animal, or maybe that's um, a nightlight, things like that, that give them comfort. You go and you hide it around the house and then they have to find it so that they know when they're, they're dysregulated, when they are upset, where they can find these things and what they are and how they help them. Moving to middle school. Um, so the first breathing exercises we do for middle school students is called color calm breath. So essentially you have them identify their negative feeling and put a color towards it. So if they're feeling anxious or if they're feeling frustrated, that might look like black or red. Usually it's darker colors. Um, and so you have them think about that. Then you have them switch and think of a color that is more calming. So yellow or pink or light blue, whatever that calming color is for them. When they breathe in, they're gonna visualize their calm color. And when they exhale, they're gonna visualize their dark color or that kind of feeling of negativity. Um, so it's a great one to get them centered and ready to listen to you. Um, another thing for middle schoolers, they're trying to figure out who they are. They're in a new school, maybe if they're coming from elementary school. So trying a new sport or an activity or a club is a great way to make those social connections and teach them slowly some time management skills um, that they can bring back to school with them. 
And then an easy one for middle schoolers as well, those who maybe don't like to share their feelings or don't like to talk as much, um, are some scaling check-ins. So asking your student on a scale of one to 10, how did we feel today went? Um, 10 being, I went to Disneyland and one being, I was the worst day. Um, and kind of just gauging from there how much your student's gonna wanna conversate um, or what you can do for them at that point. Moving to high school. Um, so in high school, the biggest breath exercise we teach them is box breathing. Essentially, you breathe in for four, you hold for four seconds, you breathe out for four seconds, you wait for four seconds. That's it, simple, square. They can visualize it when they're doing it um, and that helps self-regulate their body. Another great thing for high schoolers, um, keeping a frozen orange in your freezer. It sounds strange, but it activates every sense um, that we have. And so when they do that, they kind of lose sight of feeling anxious or overwhelmed and they get self-regulated themselves, which is kind of awesome. They don't taste great though, so I wouldn't recommend having them eat it after. <laughs> um, the last thing for high schoolers is to have them schedule in some self-care throughout the week, um, whether that's a movie night or face masks, or maybe it's a sport that they have care in, um, something that they can focus on themselves and caring for themselves and filling up their cup. What is filling up your cup? Um, so to kind of end our talk today, I kind of wanted to bring it back to this sense of hope that sometimes gets lost around motivation and that feeling of like, well, if my student's not motivated, how can I help them? I'm feeling unmotivated. How can I help them? Um, at the end of the day, we can't pour from empty cups is what I say. Um, and I think it's translated to a lot of different people around the district as well. But essentially, we all have this metaphorical cup. And everybody fills their cup differently. So for some people, it's taking five to 10 minutes a day to focus on self-care, even if that's making a snack for yourself or deep breathing like on the last slide, um, just something to kind of step away and making sure that you are motivated and we are motivated enough to then help our students and our kids. Um, how can we fill our students' cups? Um, so completing daily check-ins, like the scale, the one through 10 scale, or if your student's younger or doesn't like numbers, you can ask them like what color they feel like or what movie or song they're relating to recently. Just to bring that little bit of connection to your student to then kind of motivate them to create those connections externally as well, not only within themselves, but with their peers and with yourself. Um, and also having your student involved in a sport or an activity they can enjoy always increases motivation, increases time management skills, balancing school and sports or activities or a club um, can help set your student up for success moving out of school and into the real world. Um, and lastly, letting your student know that they can help fill their friends' cups. Um, so completing random acts of kindness, helping a person, picking up trash, giving someone a compliment and um, little things like that, not only fill other people's cups, but fill your own. Uh, so it's just a good little metaphor to kind of bring back when your student's feeling empty, when you're feeling empty, to remember that that's okay because we all have different sized cups on different days and we all need different things. So figuring out what you need in that moment or what your student needs in that moment and how you can fill their cup is a great way to instill that hope back into what they need. Um, I think that's it. Um, these are some references. We are going to open up the floor to questions. I believe Jennifer Mundy, who you met earlier, is going to be talking, so I will let her take over and I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you so much. We want to say thank you to all the mental health team that worked really hard to bring us all of these strategies and resources, so thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, we're going to now move into the Q&A like Paige had mentioned, and we had some questions that were submitted prior to this event that we are going to cover, but we would also love to hear from you. If there's any questions that have come up for you during this presentation, please put them in the Q&A and we're going to get through as many as possible. Um, so before we start going into some of the questions, I'm hoping, Jen, you could tell us a little bit about what wellness services are available through CDUSD. Absolutely. So each one of our high schools in the Conejo has a wellness center. 
And uh, I hope if you have a high school student, you will encourage them to go visit the wellness centers. Um, Lindsay, Paige, Claudia, Jen um, have put in an unbelievable amount of work to make these rooms spectacular and beautiful and relaxing and just amazing places to be. Um, they have a lot of wonderful activities. So if a student is feeling um, upset about something or anxious or um, is, is struggling with anything, including time management or any of those executive functioning skills that we talked about before, um, they can go into the wellness center and they can get support around those things. Um, I happened to be in the wellness center at one of the high schools last week, and one of our clinicians had a student sitting at a table, and they were going through the student's backpack piece by piece, looking at each piece of paper, each thing, and figuring out where it goes, what, do we need this paper, do we not, how important is it, creating a calendar, and just really helping that student get themselves to a place where they were organized, and they felt confident that they could return to their class, and they knew what was due and when it was due, and they had their assignments kind of chunked down into these manageable bite-sized pieces so they could, um, they just felt better about being there. They didn't feel overwhelmed. I know even adults, we don't like that feeling of being completely overwhelmed. And so when we know what's expected of us and when we can manage those expectations, it really helps us um, feel comfortable and confident in our in our um, school, in our education, and the work that we do. So um, in addition to that kind of walk-in support that students can get, um, students can be referred in for uh, individual support. And that might be a small group or um, individual support to help students uh, gain those extra skills that they need deal with some of the feelings of anxiety that are certainly coming up right now with everyone returning to school. Um, and each of our schools has a workshop series that they're offering that include um, wellness themed activities. Uh, journaling was one uh, coming up in, I actually cannot believe it's almost November, but here we are. It's almost November. And coming up, we have a lot of um, workshops focused on gratitude and how gratitude supports our well-being. So you'll see Lindsay, Paige, Jen, Claudia, and Allison um, doing these workshops focused on these various wellness-themed topics. So the wellness rooms are open to everyone. Anyone and anyone, everyone can walk through the door free of charge. Mm -hmm. How will students hear about uh, the upcoming workshops? So um, all of the counselors, all of the school counselors know about the workshops. Our wellness clinicians have been going into classrooms and talking about it. Um, every once in a while I'm at a school and I'll hear the announcements and they'll, they'll mention our fantastic workshops in the announcements. So students can kind of hear about it through that. We also have Wellness Wednesdays, which um, happen at all of our high schools on Wednesday at lunchtime and on Thursdays at Newberry Park High School. Um, and on Wellness Wednesday, there's some sort of wellness themed game or activity uh, where students can come and participate. It's super fun. It's very engaging and friendly and students can um, learn a little something about self-care or wellness or organization or whatever their theme is at that, um, for that week. And they have signups for the workshops at that table. So if students will go in the high schools, will go out to their quad or um, central student area, they'll find the wellness table um, on Wednesdays, except for Newberry, which is on Thursdays. Thank you for that. It's great to hear all these resources that are available directly on campus for our students. Um, okay, I'm going to move into some of the questions um, that we are receiving. Um, one of the first ones we got is regards to time management and kind of the key word is there, how do I help my child engage? Um, so the time management, we know, 
you know, we've got some great skills and how do we um, help our students, but how do we get them to actually want to do it, to be able to partake in the skills that are available mm -hmm. that they can help them with? So I think that is an excellent question. Um, and if anybody has a tried and true um, answer, please email me because I still have one student left in high school. I'd love any tips and suggestions on how to support and motivate a high school student. Um, I think as parents, this is a difficult and frustrating topic to watch your student um, not be motivated is very, very frustrating. If you have a, the type of relationship with your teenager where you can talk to them about time management, do it. Talk to them about it, support them in understanding um, how they can handle their schedule, how they can break it down into manageable pieces. We all go through periods of time with our teenage kids when maybe our voice is not particularly effective, when they want to roll their eyes at us or they're not really interested in hearing what we say. And that's when we have to employ our village, the folks around us, the adults around us that are um, also helpful in reaching our students. So that might be an aunt or uncle, it might be a neighbor, it could be a coach. Um, I can guarantee that it is your students, teachers and school counselors. So it doesn't have to be only us as parents that are in this, um, I'm gonna say battle, but that feels a little violent. That, that's in this struggle, that's in this difficult position of trying to support our students with managing their time and figuring it out. Um, I also want to just share, it's very normal for students to have a difficult time in figuring out how to manage their schedule, how to manage their homework. This is all typical, a typical part, a typical phase in development. So we don't have to panic. What we can do is actually support our students in um, choosing which time management tactic is gonna work for them and then helping them implement it. So if we do all the choosing, if we choose, you're gonna use a paper calendar and you're gonna write it down this way and you're gonna do it this way and I'm gonna check up on you and I'm gonna look at each thing every five minutes, I'm gonna be on top of you. It's no longer time management. Now we are the manager of their time. So if we can support the student in gaining those skills and understanding okay, I can make a choice. I can keep a paper calendar or I can have a calendar on my phone or computer. I can um, schedule myself in this manner or in that manner. When the students make their own choices, now they're learning for themselves how to manage their time. This of course comes with little dips and pitfalls as students make mistakes. But if, as the parents, if we can be there, um, to support them through that, they will learn how to manage their time. Um, also, it's very important for us as parents to be reaching out to other parents to support, get support for ourselves because it's difficult, it's frustrating to watch our kids struggle with something. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so, you know, trying like just what you shared, just trying to get them and get to engage. Um, how about, do you have any other suggestions to add to that for maybe a high school student who's a little older, who's 17 years old, wants some autonomy, um, feels like they've got it all figured out, and the, and I've just got some um, questions from a couple parents, like um, they feel like they're trying to offer these help and, the, and their students don't want the help, and yet they're feeling like they need it. Um, <laughs> and I know you touched on that, but something maybe specific for those high school parents that are just kind of struggling to get through to, you know, out of the pandemic and getting them re-motivated. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important that that stages of change model that Lindsay was talking about earlier, um, are, I don't know, um, Brenda, are we sharing the slides with parents or will parents have access? They will. Okay. So, yeah. So we're going to um, post it on the YouTube channel and we'll also be sending out slides to all the attendees. Yes. Yeah. So, so check that out when you have a moment, look at the slides 
and um, try to reflect on where in the cycle of change, what stage is my student at? Do they recognize that they have a problem? Or are they like, this isn't a problem, what's the big deal? What are you talking about? Because if they're in that stage, that pre-contemplation stage where they're like, I don't even know what you're talking about, everything is just fine, it's going to be really hard to get them to um, move forward or to implement any of the strategies that you, as the adult, know will work. Um, so see if you can figure out where in that cycle your student is. Um, once you've kind of figured that out, it can help you um, decide what the next step is. Um, so it might be that the student needs um, to have some experience with what happens when they don't manage their time. So they need some of that like, okay, I didn't manage my time very well now it's Sunday night and I really have to read more than I was planning on reading. Um, when as parents were able to support our students and oh, that doesn't look like that's very much fun. Um, what could we do better next time? What, what's something that you're willing to change? What's something that you're willing to try? Um, we can sometimes get our students to, um, to shift that, but um, I would start by looking at that presentation that, of the, the stages of change and, and just get an idea of where your student is. And that's great because that really focuses on that intrinsic motivation of what they want to accomplish and, and meeting them where they are. So mm -hmm. that is, that's a great idea. Um, we have a parent that wrote in and just feeling like, you know, how can we as um, staff members, as parents, as teachers, how do we reassure our kids that it's okay um, due to COVID-19 and being on remote instruction that you know, if they're feeling a little bit behind because, you know, it was just a very different way of learning um, and the stress that may come with that where kids feeling like, you know, I'm getting left behind, yet we're all kind of in the same boat. So any um, good words on what we can share with each other and with our kids on um, kind of normalizing that? Mm -hmm. So um, normalizing for our students, um, that this is a shift and that things are kind of wildly different this year than they were last year. Um, our kids were in school for a very short amount of time last year. It was on Zoom. There were a lot of um, things were very different. Um, we acclimated or a lot of students acclimated to being at school in bed with their pajamas on um, and a bag of cheese next to them and um, just in a very relaxed manner. And now they're in school and there are other humans in the same room and um, they are aware that there's other students around them that they might feel a little hypervigilant in a sense that like everybody's looking at me, which is, um, a, a developmental stage for teens to feel like people are looking at them, but maybe even more so right now because they've been uh, isolated for quite a bit of time. Um, so really kind of normalizing for students that this is a challenging time. And uh, as things progress, they will likely feel less, what would the word be? Less funky, less weird, less awkward, and more in control of what's going on around them. For a lot of students that had anxiety, and we may not have even known it as parents, before the pandemic, then while our students were at home away from other um, people and other distractions, they um, didn't have that practice of being around other people. During that time, for a lot of students, their anxiety actually grew because they were not in that practice of having these social interactions and having to ask 
adults like teachers and counselors and administrators and the folks that work as yard duty and everybody else having to talk to other people or ask for what they need. So for our students who we're noticing are struggling and it's ongoing, um, it can be really beneficial to uh, reach out for additional support. You can tell your student, and I, I hope you will tell your students about the wellness centers in the high schools. They can come in, they can talk to Lindsay, Paige, Claudia, Jen, Allison, or any of our other wellness counselors that are working and talk to them about some of the experiences that they're having um, and learn some skills on how to move forward um, because it is, it's, a, it's a transition. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I had a parent that was just kind of wondering about middle schoolers. I know they can always go in to speak with their school counselors. Um, any other wellness supports that are currently available or are coming? Just wanted to see um, where there are. Yes. Yes. So I think the school counselor is an excellent place to start for our middle school students. Um, we are lucky enough to have some fantastic wellness counselors who are working at most of our middle schools. And um, the school counselor can uh, refer a student in for wellness support. And at the middle right. schools might be a group. Um, we might have some lunch activities that are going on that are available to all students, um, things that help students build friendships and get to know each other uh, as they're navigating this new environment. For a lot of those students, um, a lot of those sixth graders, for example, I think the last time they were in, you know, pre-COVID in-person school, they were probably in fourth grade. Is that, is that right? They weren't, yeah. So, there's a big developmental leap between a fourth grader and a sixth grader. Um, so we have activities that are happening at lunchtime. We do have wellness counselors that are available at most of the middle schools. And, um, and so we're available to provide support to students at that grade level as well. Thank you for that. And, um, you know, we talked a little bit about motivation, time management, but you know, you're bringing in some good points of like anxiety, all the things that have come during this time that's increased. What if you have your, like you, your student, your child, what if they just don't want help and you kind of see them flailing, not just in regards, like I said, to academics, but like just their, maybe their, their day-to-day -day function is kind of struggling, their mood, but they're just not asking for help. Um, any suggestions for those parents? Um, I would actually, um, if Lindsay, Paige, or Claudia, if you wanted to add any tips or tricks, please just let me know and you can unmute yourself and chime in because I know you all are doing this every single day, all that all day long. Um, but for students who are um, struggling with not really wanting help, not wanting to do something, um, oftentimes that refusal, whether it's a refusal to go to school or a refusal to get support is rooted in, uh, I'm a little bit anxious because I don't know what to expect. Um, school is kind of scary to me and I'm not sure what's gonna happen there. So oftentimes there's that, that, that anxious feeling that is behind school refusal. Anxiety is a tricky little monster that often looks like anger and it looks like un, uh, unmotivation. It, it looks like something different than it actually is. It's a master of disguise. So if you have a student that presents to you as kind of angry or um, upset about things a lot, or a student that's refusing to go to school and it appears that they are like uninterested or I don't care, or, this doesn't matter, it could very likely be that your student is feeling kind of nervous or anxious about things, but it just is coming out as uh, refusing to do something or I don't need this or I'm unmotivated or I'm angry and upset. Okay. Yeah, kind of reading between the lines sometimes, but, um what appears may not be real evident at first. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. Yeah. Um, how about um, 
kids that are struggling with so social stresses. And you brought that up already, but I know I've met with a lot of students who I forgot how to socialize. I don't know how to talk with my friends. I don't know if they are my friends. And so, you know, you've got also all of the, um, the peer group stresses that kids are trying to um, manage. So maybe some of the skills that we talked about tonight and anything else that you'd like to incorporate that would be helpful for those parents whose kids are suffering from social anxiety. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I, I think those friendship groups while we were remote really shifted for a lot of students. Um, I know my son, I thought it was so interesting. One of the things that he said he missed the most um, was the kids that he saw in the hallway in between classes that he isn't necessarily friends with and doesn't, doesn't necessarily hang out with all the time. But I, I just really miss that I'm not seeing that kid every day in between classes or, um, you know, just having that wider social network, that wider social group being part of a school community. So as students are returning to this new, um, it's not new, it's old school. It's this new way of being after being remote for so long. Um, we are seeing that students are feeling um, more easily upset, more, they're having more difficulty navigating friendships. And I think for a lot of our students, they're out of practice. Um, most of these things take, take time, they take practice, there's some skill building. As a sixth grader, as an example, the last time they were in person, they were fourth graders. So a lot of developmental change happens between the time a student is in fourth grade and, and sixth grade, or for those um, eighth graders, who are now returning to school and they're in 10th grade. Big developmental shifts. Um, for our second graders, the last time they were in school, they were in the middle of kinder. I mean, just huge, huge gaps of time. Um, the wellness centers are offering um, uh, during Wellness Wednesdays opportunities for students to come together and engage in kind of fun, um, non-threatening, easy friendship building activities. Um, some of our wellness centers have newcomer or friendship building groups for students who are new to the school. So we're really doing the best we can to reach out and engage students and bring them together. And um, I was speaking with a clinician this week and she said the first week the students all sat in the group and it was, she said, oh my gosh, I, I wasn't sure what to do. They were all so quiet. They they wouldn't say anything and they would only engage with her. So each, each student in the group would only talk to the clinician. And, and it took a little while, but you know, by week three, the students are now engaging with each other. And so it isn't just the adult that's handling it, but it had to start with the adult handling it. So the, the clinician was the first one to sort of say, I'm bringing everybody together and we're gonna talk about this topic. And, um, eventually the students sort of dropped their defenses. They felt a little more comfortable and they started being able to communicate with each other. Um, so I think it's gonna take time. If you have younger students in um, elementary school or even in middle school or maybe even in high school um, and you can arrange groups of kids to meet in a safe place where um, like, a, like a park or a playground and have opportunities for kids to come together for um, socialization, I think that is um, really beneficial. Remember that kids are needing some support and coaching. So if your kid is struggling with how to do something that maybe they knew how to do before, like share or take turns or something like that, parents can kind of be there to coach and support children in, um, and engaging in those activities that, that they used to do maybe more easily and now are struggling with. And, and with older kids, encouraging them to be involved in clubs at their school or local organizations, um, of course, team sports or um, theater, choir, all of those types of activities, um, trying to get kids involved in something. And at the same time, 
protecting them from that overload of being in school all day and having sports and then going to tutoring and having their day go on and on, kind of finding that balance of protecting their time and making sure that they have that social engagement. Yeah, so I'm hearing just time and as a process. Mm -hmm. um, I think you gave a really good um, observation, at least for me with kids being from middle school to high school that, you know, uh, eighth grade to 10th grade, those are big jumps, no matter what level of school you're going into. So I think that's a really good way to look at it. I got a couple of questions from parents who are talking about how to help their student, um, their child balance that feeling that you were just saying about being overwhelmed, managing sports, homework. So finding kind of that life balance in doing all of the things that they are expected to do and want to do, um, you know, sports, school, hanging out with friends, but then, uh, you know, at the same time, they're feeling overwhelmed. So any tips on helping uh, parents help their kids find balance in their day-to-day -day living? Mm -hmm. So the skills that the wellness counselor spoke about during the presentation about time management, using some of those apps or technology resources to help students think about how to manage their time can be helpful. Um, and then helping children think about the idea of having a, a healthy balance on their plate. So if, if we were actually preparing dinner for our children, we would be thinking about what is on their plate. Like we would have some protein and we would have some vegetables and we would have some fruits and we would have some carbohydrates and we would have whatever the things are that we felt were important in order for our child to have a balanced meal on their plate. And we need to think about that same healthy platter idea when it comes to the rest of their, um, the rest of the activities in their life. So helping them realize, okay, what do you need to put on your plate for education? And that might be, I'm going to read this chapter of this book, I'm going to write this essay, I'm going to do my math homework, whatever those things are. And then what do you need to put on your platter for physical activity? And maybe it's already built in. I'm on the baseball team. I'm on the dance team. And so I have practice every day for an hour. Great. So we've got academics covered. We've got physical activity covered. What about socialization? And for a lot of students, they might say, oh my gosh, the greatest time of the day is when I'm at baseball practice because I'm hanging out with my friends. It's so much fun. And so we've killed two birds with one stone. That's a terrible reference, but we've done two things at once. Um, we have a physical activity and we have it, it involved in a team sports. We have both. Um, what about spending time on your own? Do you have any time downtime where you're just sort of like chilling on your own? And so helping kids manage that kind of healthy platter idea um, with their life. So thinking about physical activity, thinking about academic activity, thinking about socialization. Um, they may have um, family or religious obligations that are important. Um, mm -hmm. Sort of that internal reflective time, which might be like, you know, through um, a mindfulness or through, you um, just spending some time alone reading for pleasure or whatever. So thinking about how can I have a balance on my, on my platter, on my own personal life? As a parent, maybe kind of helping them go around and like you're saying, figure that out. Cause that might, when they're overwhelmed, that might not be something they're able to objectively see because they are so overwhelmed. So that's a great tip. Um, how about for kids um, that maybe kind of keep things in? They are maybe reluctant to open up and share with their with their parents, and parents want to know and hear their what their kids are thinking and feeling. So, any um, suggestions on uh, for parents on how they can encourage their kids to share with them more? I have two suggestions for that. One is um, I'm laughing because it takes me back quite a while ago. Uh, when I was in therapy school, the first thing that you learn in therapy is like, you can't like how to not say anything. And so they put you in these, these um, 
dyads with another partner and you have to listen to the person talk and you cannot say a word. You just have to like nod and you have to see if you get your therapy skills in this way. And one of the assignments that I had was to listen to another person and that other person had to talk for like, I don't remember the time, five minutes or 10 minutes. And I wasn't allowed to say anything. And so I did this with my teenage son and um, I, you know, was new with this. I had no idea what was going to happen. And he went on and on and on. I learned so much about him and that 10 minute conversation. And I said zero things. He said everything. So it was sort of like he started talking and then I didn't say anything. I just did the therapy nod and I just listened and I didn't have a, a judgy look on my face. I didn't have that parental look. I just listened. So that's the first one is to just let them go, let them talk. Um, the second one is uh, take advantage of the car. The car is one of the best places to have a conversation with your kid. It is so safe. You are not looking at each other. I think we get caught up in like proper conversations. We're looking at each other's eyes. And really that can be so overwhelming and intense that it shuts people down. The car is great. You cannot look at each other. And you're strapped in. The doors are locked. Nobody's going anywhere. You're, you're there. And so use that as an opportunity to have a conversation. So the first one was don't say anything. The second one was the car. And actually the last one is if you are talking to your student and this happens, um, this is every parent has been through this and you say today, your kid almost always says, fine, good. I don't know. What'd you do today? I don't know. So when you get those sort of broad answers, instead of asking, how was your day? Which is like, how was my day? It was huge. It was six hours long. I was at school all day or even longer. Ask a very pointed question. And it could be ridiculous and it could be less ridiculous. So the question could be something like, um, what color was your math teacher's shirt? Or who sat in front of you in English class? Or when you had lunch today, what was the kid next to you eating? Something that's like, so detail oriented, it helps the kid focus on a specific moment in time. And sometimes you're going to get an answer like his shirt was red. That's it, mom. That's all you're getting from me. And sometimes they'll be like his, I don't know, his shirt was like, oh, he was wearing the red. And then they'll, they'll kind of talk. So those are my suggestions for getting kids to talk more. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, how about for a child who is just still afraid with COVID-19 um, that they're going to become infected? And how can we, as parents, negate some of those concerns? Because we, you know, we're, we're still in the middle of, of masks and, and still changes happening, and, and that can create a lot of anxiety for, for students. So any ways to help kind of settle that for them? Um, there is quite a bit of information out there on COVID enough to make any one of us cuckoo. It is a lot of information out there. Um, and students are exposed through, um, I mean, you know, if you have a television, the, te the television is on, they're exposed to information from that. But also every time they log on to anything, there's some information about COVID. Um, they're hearing their peers talk about it. We are hearing about some of the tragic losses um, associated with COVID. This is a collective trauma that we're all experiencing. So if your student is reacting to it, um, that is to be expected to a degree. If your student is really needing that constant reassurance, that might signify that it would be a good idea to get the enlist the help of a mental health professional to help you manage that. Um, you can manage things on your own by reducing the amount of um, exposure that your student has. If you have a younger student, that's easier to limit than if you have an older student. Ex 
uh, reduce the exposure to things like news um, and all of the terrible stories that uh, happen about COVID and point out where there is safety. Because although there is danger with COVID, it is there for sure. Um, there is so much safety everywhere you go. So as you're moving around the um, world with your, your student, with your child, um, particularly if you have younger children, you can talk about all the ways that there is safety. So you might have your child and you're headed to the grocery store and you might say, wow, look at, there, like everybody here is wearing a mask. This is amazing. People are really being conscientious and they're really concerned about safety. And I see so many people using hand sanitizer and um, all of these different ways that students can um, be aware. That, yes, there is risk with COVID, uh, uh, absolutely. But look at all the ways that all of the people in our community are keeping themselves safe, keeping each other safe, and um, and provide that reassurance to our students. So great, a lot of protection built into um, our daily life that we're seeing, like you're saying, you know, with the hand sanitizer, there's a lot of positive things that we can focus on. Um, I wanna say thank you, Jen, for coming tonight and for, for taking all the Q&A and also for the mental health team, um, providing a great presentation um, for Overloaded in October. I think um, that resonates with a lot of people right now. Um, so we thank you for all the strategies that you've provided for us. And I just wanted you to know as well, I know I mentioned it before, but we are going to be emailing out the, power, the slide PowerPoint presentation to all the attendees. So you'll have some good resources to refer back to. And we'll also have the um, recording posted on the Kineo USD YouTube channel within a few days. So we want to thank all of our parents for attending tonight's presentation event brought to you by the Kineo Schools Foundation and the Breakthrough Student Assistance Program. Um, we look forward to seeing you at upcoming events and we wish you all a good night and look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. <laughs>